Arms Control Wonk and the Middle East Brief Podcast. This is a crossover podcast that I am bringing to you because I am the host of both shows. My name is Aaron Stein. Uh, I am the Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, Jeffrey and Anne, my co-hosts on the Arms Control Wonk Podcast, or I am sure, you know, at this time of night uh, in, in California, either having a nice cocktail or uh, and is probably baking and for uh my colleagues at the foreign policy research institute uh, we have tomorrow off this is thursday before july 4th and i can guarantee you most of them are probably enjoying a nice cocktail uh i am recording a podcast uh with fabian hintz uh fabian uh welcome to the show thanks so much uh remind me what do you do at cns again i forgot what your exact title is uh i'm a research associate yeah so the re- reason i wanted to have you on both shows is because well, basically, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on in Iran. It's been blasting around my Twitter, and whenever there is something that happens in Iran, particularly when it comes to explosions um, in missile bases and um, Iran's main enrichment facility, I, I click over to you and direct people to you. So let's just start right there. You know, a mm-hmm. couple of days ago, we had an explosion, uh, uh, and then we were off and running. So why don't you just take take it from there? Yeah, so a couple of days ago, we had an explosion that was pretty spectacular. It happened at nighttime, basically lit up this whole sky over Tehran. And pretty soon, the Iranians were saying that some industrial gas tanks had exploded in the general public area of Polchin, which, of course, we all know is like a large industrial military industrial complex in Iran where explosives get produced that had a minor role in the, or perhaps not so minor role in the pre-2003 nuclear weapons program. But once we got satellite pictures, we could confirm that it actually happened in a different area. Um, in the Khojir area of eastern Tehran, a mountainous area where most of, of Iran's missile industries are actually located. So that was quite quite revealing and quite interesting. Yeah, and I, I remember, you know, as this was happening, you know, a, a, a group of us, you know, talking about it privately. And, and, you know, it became quite clear pretty quickly that the explosion was at least near um, this missile base. And it, it obviously made me think of, you know, previous explosions at Iranian missile yes. bases. And, and, you know, we were waiting for pictures to come out. So, I mean, what did the pictures reveal when, once once we got uh, some satellite imagery overhead? So uh, I was really curious to see whether this is Pete Ganeh 2.0, because we all remember the 2011 explosion that completely wiped out an Iranian uh, missile development site, killed the, basically the founder of Iran's missile program. Once we got the pictures, we saw it was actually indeed at one of the facilities within that large complex, but the damage was much more limited. So talking about the location, if you look at Khojir, it's all sub-organizations of the aerospace industries organization, which of course is subject um, to the control of the Ministry of Defense and Armed Forces Logistics, and is the prime producer of Iranian ballistic missiles, among other things. And we all know the Sheikh, so... Um, Shahid Hamad Industrial Group, which does liquid propellant ballistic missiles, Shahid Bokhari Industrial Group, which does solid propellant ballistic missiles, and they all have various facilities associated with missile productions in there. Now that we now that we knew the exact location of the explosion, we could see it was at a standalone facility having its own perimeter. So it actually appeared to be gas tanks, and the Iranians released a short video of the site of the explosion showing nothing more than a a few gas tanks, and that actually seemed to be correct, but was within that standalone facility, which was right next to a salt propellant missile production facility. So that, that was quite interesting. Would you say they got pretty lucky there? Um, it's difficult to know. I mean, the whole area is protected pretty well against explosions. I mean, you have lots of berms, the whole area is mountainous, so it looks like a pretty safe facility, at least when compared to other Iranian ballistic missile bases that have blown up in the past that didn't have protective equipment and it was still a bit away from like the main production building so i would say they were a bit lucky but probably also the explosion was simply not was very spectacular but simply not large enough to really cause a disaster but perhaps not you never know yeah which brings us to the explosion today which you know is much more eyebrow raising. And so when I started yes. DMing you in the morning, you know, the morning East Coast times, you would inform me that you were you had been up all night and that you needed to sleep before you we could do this podcast, which which suited me well because I had to do a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you walk us through why you were up all night um, and, and give the listeners a background of what exactly mm-hmm. just happened? Um, so first you had some news about an incident or potentially a fire 
there uh, at one of uh, Iran's nuclear sites, the Natanz enrichment site, which of course is Iran's largest uh, nuclear enrichment site and one of the most controversial nuclear sites in Iran. And of course, in the beginning, we didn't know what actually happened. We had very few clues as to that. And the first clue that there actually was something major happening came in form of the um, NASA fire maps, where you could see that actually a fire had taken place, some sort of fire or explosion at one of um, the locations within the Natanz perimeter. And then the Iranians did a very unusual step. So the Iranian Atomic Energy Organization released a picture of the site damage. And the Iranians very quickly said, you know, it's just a hangar, just a shed in the process of construction, not much happening there. But that picture showed enough detail to geolocate it to a very particular building within the Natanz complex. And that building has previously been identified as as Iran's new centrifuge assembly workshop inside Natanz. And that is quite something, because if you have some storage area where, let's say, they're doing a welding job and something burns down, that's one thing. But if you see a building that looks like very damaged and shows sign of an explosion happening and not just a fire, and that is the new centrifuge assembly workshop, that's, that's quite significant, I would say. Then, of course, to make everything even more murky, the BBC Farsi service reported that they had received a statement before any news of an incident at Natanz broke um, by a group calling itself the Cheetahs of the Homeland, who was claiming responsibility for an attack against Natanz, against an assembly site, that's the way they called it at Natanz. And they were saying that they're a group of dissidents within the Iranian security establishment trying to sub do acts of sabotage. And that, of course, is a very new development that we haven't really seen before in Iran, these kind of statements. Yeah, I mean, when I saw that, you know, and it, it immediately brought to mind about whether or not this was some sort of front group for like the Mujahideen al you know, sort of the NCRI that, yeah. you know, kind of kicked it all off in like August 2002, because they were probably like a, like, like an entity to launder state intelligence through about undeclared nuclear facilities, one of which was a centrifuge um, production facility, um, albeit not this one. Uh, you know, what do you make of that? I mean, I, it, it's kind of hard to like parse out and figure out, but clearly when you see some of these ground truth mm -hmm. pictures, and maybe you can talk about how you, you went through and found those, or I mean, they eventually started popping up all over Twitter to where I found them. Mm -hmm. There's significant damage there, right? Yeah. So the um, <clears throat> the group itself, it's. I mean, you see some sort of signs of erosions within the Iranian security establishment a little recently, but still, it seems so implausible because I mean, think put yourself into the shoes of like a guy working inside the Iranian security establishment, having the capabilities of blowing something up like that. Um. You will get killed for that. If they catch you, they will kill you for that. You will get executed. So uh, why would you do that to sabotage a nuclear facility? It, it doesn't really make that much sense to me. If you're really willing to escalate that much to hurt the Islamic Republic, uh, if you're taking that risk, you could take completely different risks and do like other stuff. So that doesn't really make sense to me. I was also thinking of the MEK and the way it laundered information. So to me, it looks a bit like a front organization but then the question is like why would we suddenly have that so i would have to go back but like as far as i can remember when you had like stuxnet and the assassination of iranian nuclear scientists which kind of surprisingly have been forgotten quite a bit in the west i don't think there was ever like a claim of responsibility by any group but i would have to check again so that's pretty interesting no i mean yeah, the other thing that made me think about was sort of the wave of assassinations both about uh, that that are typically linked back and associated with the Israelis. And, the, yeah. and I initially began to think like, are we at the precipice because of some of the, some of the restrictions within the JCPOA are starting to come off. I mean, we saw secretary Pompeo or on the precipice of coming off. We saw secretary Pompeo, you know, sort of make his case that the arms embargo shouldn't come off. And I, I, I don't, I'm not holding my breath that he's going to be successful in that. Um, but you know, we're sort of staring down, I believe we're only a couple of years away, you know, from when some of the um, the restrictions on enrichment begin to fall away. And I'm wondering if there's a state actor behind this who is looking to either send a message to the Iranians that we're watching you and B, try and put a dent in their program. Yeah, I was also thinking a lot about these early 2010 years. I mean, if you look back, you had some sort of American maximum 
pressure campaign back then. You had a nuclear program by Iran that didn't have the kind of limits later imposed by the JCPOA. And both are parallels to today's situation. So it's kind of makes sense that we would see that sort of kinetic sabotage component emerge again as a way to slow the program. Um, and I think like take Taking out a workshop for the assembly of advanced centrifuges and their calibration, and their balancing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that's that's quite a good way to slow down a very, very sensitive part of Iran's nuclear program, I guess. Yeah, I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about about what it is that they were assembling there, because if I'm remembering correctly, and do correct me if I'm wrong, is that this was for more of the 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 advanced centrifuges that they have been testing. So these advanced centrifuges are sort of more efficient, just to be to be. Sort of uh, simplistic about it than um, the older generation, which they typically use now, and that w- then that are mandated by the JCPOA, and so that you can enrich more efficiently with less amount of centrifuges, so you can enrich more material more quickly. <laughs> if I can just be simplistic about it. Yeah, definitely. So uh, this is a rather new, new facility. They started building it um, already a while ago, but it only became operational like I think two years ago or something like that. And um, it's intended for more advanced centrifuges and. Uh, and what I think Jeffrey has pointed out quite a bit on the Arms Control Long podcast and other people have pointed out that like the research and development uh, of new centrifuges is something that is qualitatively quite different from other Iranian steps when it comes to the JCPOA provisions because you can always ship an excess of enriched uranium outside of the country you can blend down you can uninstall centrifuges etc but like once you've done the research and the development of an advanced centrifuge and once you have like made it a much more efficient uh, centrifuge uh, running uh, smoothly, that's something that is knowledge that you can't really reverse. So uh, to me, it makes a lot of sense that you would target this kind of capability. It kind of goes hand in hand with the carbon fiber stuff that you and Jeffrey are working on with their missile program. I mean, one of the things to do is to make these centrifuges lighter uh, and carbon fiber comes into that as well. Yeah, I mean, and maybe... You know, I know that you've been tracking this, you know, for listeners who are not as well immersed in this, you know, just the facility that was destroyed. I mean, they the Iranians were like, like basically showed it off. I want to say like two years ago, um, which did that make your job sort of with the like the 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 OSINT sleuthing easier because you, you had a picture to begin with. Um, and and, and you know, how did that factor into all of it? So it's quite interesting if you look at like how you could do that. So the first thing that I did was like the fire uh, satellite imagery. And that kind of indicated at what part of the facility something ha- happened. And then I was sleuthing around the facility and ISIS had identified the um, that building in particular as the new centrifuge workshop just using uh, time lines, using Iranian announcements about when it was finished, etc., etc. And then the Iranians themselves um, released a video inside the facility, which mostly showed the inside of the facility, it showed a short um, short view of the entrance, but not enough to geolocate it. But Iranian media actually also released two other images of the entrance that has a very, very particular and unique shape and that you could match the satellite pictures to say, okay, that's really uh, the centrifuge workshop. And the picture of the damaged building um, was pretty easy to geolocate because of a very characteristic shape of an administrative building in the background. The... um, the kind of shape of the building itself, um, lightning pole, uh, not lightning poles, uh, like lamp posts and everything. So the classic tools of geolocation, if you put all of that together, you can have a really high confidence that this is actually the centrifuge workshop. And, you know, because you were quoted in the New York Times uh, about this. And one of the things that was interesting that caught my that caught my attention in that piece is that like like a lot of Iranian nuclear facilities, a lot of it is built underground, you know, sort of to insulate mm-hmm. it or at least sort of provide some modicum of, modicum of protection from, uh, you know, ostensible American ground uh, airstrikes against it. You know, is there any sense, you know, based upon what you're looking at about how much of the facility was actually destroyed? Was it just this top level? I mean, uh, as far as I can tell, we don't know. Um, but, but I do know that they did send some top level people like immediately over there. So clearly it was a serious thing, not something mm-hmm. minor. So if you look at the damage itself, it looks pretty serious and there are signs of an explosion and you would probably have like centralized ventilation systems and everything that could get damaged. So it did look pretty serious how far the damage was was in terms of equipment inside, that is, of course, difficult to know. How long it will take them to rebuild that thing is difficult to know. It's, I would agree it's interesting that they build it over grounds. Um, 
in the first place, I guess my guess is that once Natanz was exposed and you had the threat of airstrikes, like perhaps it didn't make much of a difference because the stuff at Natanz is of course buried, but not buried as deeply as let's say Fordo. So um, perhaps it was just a more efficient way because in the end it wouldn't protect against an airstrike anyway to put it underground at Natanz. Yeah, and I think we should, I mean, just reiterate to listeners, like, this isn't, I mean, Natanz is a relatively large site, I mean, like, relatively, mm-hmm. it, it, so this was just one building within it, this wasn't in the main enrichment hall, I think we should say that, right? Yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah. It's uh, also interesting because the statement of the group said that they deliberately targeted a building overground so that the Iranians wouldn't be able to deny what happened. Which I found quite interesting. That is interesting. I mean, this group is something that, that like, I, I'm like hesitant to even talk about because I just yeah. never heard of it. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. That doesn't mean that they aren't true. But I, I am. Let's say that my, um, let's say that my skepticism meter. You know, the the Middle East brief yeah. isn't as R-rated as the Arms Control Wong podcast, so I won't swear. But <laughs> but like the my skepticism meter is pretty high on the sort of validity of, of this group that claimed responsibility. Although I do take BBC Farsi quite seriously, like yeah. like their journalists are top notch and they are yeah. a very reputable outlet. So clearly something was happened, you know, something I, said, somebody sent it to them. I mean, I have strong doubts that this is like this rogue inside group uh, doing all that stuff, but like even the it's just a cutout for like let's say another intelligence service or the MEK or the MEK Indian intelligence service the fact that they put that inside um, the statement is pretty interesting because if you think of sabotage you can always see sabotage in two ways the one is actually to cause damage in order to slow down or even destroy programs the other one is psychological and you can of course mix both of them and I would have a feeling that like doing sabotage that might be less efficient than like in terms of slowing down Iran's nuclear program, then blowing up centrifuges, but one that can't be denied, has a certain psychological component to it. Um, so that's something I find quite interesting thing to think about. Yeah, and I mean, even just the act of smuggling an explosive into oh, yeah. this place is, is, is <laughs> oh, yeah. something not to be overlooked. I mean, that that's not easy. So, like, 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 clearly somebody like did their homework here. I do that's wonder why wild. they chose. I, I mean, it's it's an unanswerable question, but why did they choose this facility? Like, 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 why this? I mean, maybe it was one that had less site security because it really is just sort of a, a, a it's kind of a workshop, you know. I mean, well, it's not really a workshop, but it's kind of an assembly area for for mm-hmm. centrifuges. It's it doesn't there's no enrichment going on in there as much as we can tell, uh, and so it maybe has less security. I don't know, but like, it doesn't. I, mean, I don't know, go ahead. It's very much inside the security zone of Natanz within the double perimeter. So getting explosives and the right amount of explosives inside must have been really, really difficult. Um, so I would say it is it is pretty interesting. Why did they choose this one? I think like the research and development angle and like the new centrifuges, that's definitely one reason. If you think about it in the technical terms, if you want to slow down the program and Iran's capability to potentially break out one day at a secret site or something. I mean, like slowing down the research and development of advanced centrifuges is something you would really want to do. But on the other hand, striking at the heart of Iran's most important nuclear site in a way that is non-deniable and actually produces imagery. I mean, if you have like uh, 5,000 centrifuges blowing up and you don't have any imagery, like the psychological impact is still kind of minor. That's not the way the modern media environment works. So from a psychological point of view, I think it's also very well chosen targets if you want so is there anything i'm leaving out that i should ask you about that i'm forgetting about let me think no not really that's everything i can think of right now i mean the really interesting question is whether we're going to see other mysterious explosions happening at other sites yeah i mean i mean that that's the open question i mean i i do say i i i'm not i, I think the first explosion the one at the shig the one at the missile yeah. facility i i do sort of think that that was an accident the, mm-hmm. I, i'm not you know, look you can never be certain but I, I do think that that one was an accident the one at, at natan's i clearly do not think is an accident um but you know you never know i mean at first when i saw the explosion at um Spig or um, the Khoji area, I was thinking it's probably an accident because, you know, accidents at missile factories happen quite a bit, like um, even in countries with like a long history of missile development and high safety standards, they have 
And the other thing is, we just don't know, like Iran's economic crisis, how has it affected standard maintenance and everything? There wasn't that much damage, so I thought it was an accident. But I'm a little less sure by now because it's just such a coincidence to have like these two things and in a very short period of time. And again, with Spig, it's like uh, Hojir, it's the explosion didn't do much damage, but I mean, it was spectacular. So if you want to have it like with a more a more psychological effect of the whole sabotage thing, it would still make sense to do something like that, I would guess. Um, another aspect that we perhaps could mention is the lack of apparent, like we can't really confirm it, lack of casualties of both attacks. That's something I find quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, because again, the, the Bidgine, I mean, for, for listeners, you know, there was a very large explosion in a very sort of eccentrically run missile facility out in the desert. Yes. <laughs> That's a good way of describing it. You know, where they didn't take as many safety precautions as you saw, you know, sort of at the place. Uh, <laughs> they didn't take a lot of safety precautions, and the man in charge of it has lost his head because of it, although he is dead. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's hard to compare that. The assassination of Iranian nuclear scientists, I mean, it sounds horrible, but if you want to slow down a program like uh, destroying the human expertise would actually make a lot of sense. But apparently we haven't seen that. I mean, the Iranians could also be just lying. Perhaps some people died in Natan's accident. Uh, it would make sense if you want to avoid major escalation to do it in a way that not a lot of people get killed or like no people get killed at all. So perhaps that's like one of the factors behind it. But uh, I'm not sure at this point. Yeah, I mean, I agree, and and at some point we we, we delve into speculation, which which we we're not exactly sure. I think what we can confidently say is that you, know, you has done, have done the sort of the the all nighter, if you will. I, I am long past all nighters. Um, <laughs> Me too, actually, that was an exception. I haven't done yeah. it in a while. I, so, I feel uh, pretty bad right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, one other thing one uh, could be mentioning is it's interesting to see how the Islamic Republic's officials dealt with both cases because they they clearly can't deny those things anymore, especially with the Khojir explosion because it was visible all of Tehran. So now they're trying, having the strategy of not flatly denying things, but just playing them down. Yeah. So the first statement about Khojir was, yeah, it was a gas explosion not related to a military site in the general area of Porchin. And apparently, if you're like old fashioned, you can also call that part of Khojir the general area of Porchin, even though it's quite far away from from the actual current protein side. And in Natanz, they were very adamant that it's just like a hangar where nothing really happened, uh, which is a bit ridiculous because you actually have the video of the guy um, saying that in front of the building right now. And you can see uh, quite advanced ventilation equipment in the background. So apparently it's not just some storage uh, shaft. Um, but I would say even this kind of new strategy doesn't work anymore in today's world. Like it's now only a question of a few hours probably until we get satellite pictures confirming, finally confirming the location of the explosion at Natanz or the fire at Natanz. So uh, they adapted their strategy, but still it's not, it's not really working these days. Yeah. And if I had to guess, if Jeffrey was leading this podcast, he would sort of take this because I know that he's interested in is like the assassination campaigns and how it's more difficult to hide them now, but how you wouldn't want to hide them right now, how you can publicize it using open source yeah. and how that may explain the, the, the early tip off to the BBC Farsi. But I am speaking for Jeffrey and I, one should never speak for Jeffrey. He is his own mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I think with that, um, uh, Fabian, as always, um, this has been illuminating and fun. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, uh, I know it's it's about dinner time on the West Coast. It's nine thirty over here on the East Coast, so uh, uh, it's 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 definitely time for me to uh, to sign off. So thanks, Fabian, for coming on. Thanks everybody for Thank listening. You so much. It was great. And thanks to the Crossover Podcast, both to the Arms Control Wonk Podcast uh, and to the Middle East Brief. <laughs>